Hi, it's Mr. Evans. Welcome to Room 310 Biology, and this is the first of my HSA Biology Reviews. I hope that along with what you're doing in your class and the studying you're doing your, on your own, you find this useful. Uh, I'd like to remind you of the format of the exam. The HSA is broken into three 45-minute long sessions. In between each one, you can go out and get a drink, stretch your legs, walk around a little bit. The exam is all multiple choice. There are no essays for you to write on this exam. It's all multiple choice. There will, however, and they're usually in the first section, be some technical reading passages. What these are are short science articles or short readings of science information. And you might be asked to pick out some important science concepts or science vocabulary or ideas that are embedded in with each one. Exam is very doable, and if you need a little extra motivation, remember that it is a graduation requirement in the state of Maryland. I'd like to see you take care of business your first time out. You don't want to have to take the exam over and over, and I'd like you to avoid doing a bridge project that takes up a lot of time and pulls you away from classes and things that you'd rather spend your time doing to work on that bridge project. So let's just take care of this right off the first time out. I'm going to focus this video on the scientific method. You've been learning about this in many science classes. Uh, human beings are curious, they ask a scientific question, and then they may state a hypothesis. You might have to pick out a hypothesis on the exam. I like to think of them as an if-then statement, but we don't always see that type of, of wording used. But the basic idea is, if I change this, then what will be the result? If I vary this, then what will I see happen in response? Um, the experiment gets performed, and it has to be a fair test. And we'll go over the conditions that must be met for it to be a fair experiment that gives valid results. We collect data, and I like to think of this as numbers and units. Science likes numbers and units. And I have a slide on which unit is appropriate to use with which type of measurement. And in many released exams I've looked at, you're given some data and you are asked to decide what conclusion a scientist may have reached upon getting that data. So let's practice one. Imagine someone wanted to do an experiment to find out the effect of varying the amount of fertilizer on the growth of plants. So I want to change how much fertilizer plants get and see how plants respond to that. So I think the way I would approach this is I would get quite a few um, pots of soil and I want to vary how much fertilizer each plant receives. So the key terms to know here are independent and dependent variables. The independent variable, or the IV, is what I'm changing in my experiment. So for instance, I might give this plant one gram of fertilizer per day, this one two grams, this one three grams, and so on. I vary how much fertilizer each plant receives. My dependent variable, or DV, how well will the plants grow in response to the varying amounts of fertilizer? So I've, I've taken care of my plants, and maybe this one grows a little bit. This one grows a little better. This one does even better. Plant with four grams per day does super well. This one got too much fertilizer, and I didn't know that would happen. It hardly grows at all. My independent variable was the varying amounts of fertilizer. My dependent variable, I need to go through and measure how tall each plant got in response to the varying amounts of fertilizer. So it's really key that you learn these terms. Now for this to be a fair, valid science experiment, I need to have some constants. What do I need to keep the same among all these potted plants to make sure that it's only the fertilizer making a difference? I bet you could come up with a list yourself. I'm already thinking I need to keep the temperature the same, the quantity of water I give the same, um, and they certainly have to be the same type of plant 
it wouldn't be very useful to compare a corn plant to a tomato plant. I need to have the same type of plant throughout. The other thing I like to remind you of is we also need a control group. The control group is used for comparison. These plants receiving the varying amounts of fertilizer, they're my experimental group. I need a control group. And my control group are going to be plants that receive no fertilizer at all. I want to find out how the fertilizer is affecting plant growth. I need a control group for comparison. So maybe this plant receives no fertilizer whatsoever. All of these are key terms that you're going to have to know for the exam. There's a, quite a few graph questions that I've seen on the exam. And there's a couple of easy tricks that might help you out. So let me draw my graph axes here. And the key thing to remember is which variable goes on which axis. Um, a good colleague of mine from years ago taught me this little trick. The independent variable always, always goes on the x-axis. Independent is a longer word than dependent. And the word is so long, it's tired and has to lay down. It's silly, but it might help you remember that the independent variable, the longer word, always goes on the x-axis, so our dependent variable always goes on the y. Now, in our last example, what was our independent variable? It was the amount of fertilizer, and we need a unit there, and I think that was grams, and our dependent variable was plant growth, and we need a unit, so I think we'll use centimeters. <coughs> And I think we had results that look something like this. Uh, bar graph would be really appropriate right here. And there you go. Typical question. Which variable was the independent variable in this situation? The quantity of fertilizer given. Some of the questions will ask you to uh, make some observations about a graph. For instance, you might be asked um, how much taller did uh, the, this plant get then this one. So we're just looking at our intervals over here on the side and, and making a little judgment there. Look at all your choices and I'm sure you'll be getting that question right. The tools that you might be asked to identify on the exam and their purpose or their unit. Um, we're looking at graduated cylinders so we're thinking about measuring volume of a liquid and our unit would be milliliters. If you are asked a question about length, uh, remember that the metric unit for those is centimeters or perhaps meters. If we're asked a question about mass, uh, triple beam balance, uh, we're measuring in grams or might be measuring in kilograms. Um, safety questions sometimes pop up on the exam. How do we stay safe in a laboratory environment? Um, certainly there might be questions about protective gear like goggles or perhaps a student should be wearing gloves or a chemical apron. Um, these questions are generally common sense. Um, think about reading directions and staying safe and I'm sure you're going to get those questions correct on the exam. You might be asked to identify certain problems that pop up on the exam, and uh, a classic one is the idea of bias. I like to think of bias in science as not keeping an open mind. Um, scientists should be open to whatever results that they get. Um, they should be looking to just simply report the results that they get. Um, but that doesn't always happen. And a good real-life example is this drug here, Viox. It was developed in the 1990s to treat arthritis. And the scientists who developed it, I'm sure they were getting paid, they were making some money. And they may have withheld some information that the drug actually also caused heart attacks in a few people. So the drug's been taken off the market. Uh, but a way to avoid bias might be to use a placebo. And a placebo is an inert or harmless substance. So maybe I have a control group of people taking a placebo. They're taking a sugar pill. And my experimental group is actually taking the medication. And then we can compare the effects of the drug on the people. Some other problems you might see are simply not having any control group at all. 
so we have no way to to con compare anything. Uh, data can be skewed all sorts of ways, but these are two good ones to look at, or maybe there were, were no constants. Um, just read your, your questions carefully and think what makes a good scientific test possible. Um, there might be a few math problems on the exam. Here's a, a fairly typical one. Nothing will require a calculator. Um, you'll be given paper and pencil to work out things on, the, on your own on the side. Uh, this question asks, how much larger is a bacterium than a virus? And we're given the size of both organisms in meters. Uh, this is one millionth of a meter for the bacterium. And viruses, which are not living organisms, much, much, much smaller. And I'm simply asked to compare the sizes. And I can say that the bacterium is 1 times 10 to the fifth times larger than the virus because it's 1 times 10 to the fifth power is the difference between those two numbers. Here's another example of an experimental design question I pulled off of a released exam. Uh, students were given uh, I think 20 push-ups to do in a certain amount of time and their heart rate was examined. So we're asked to pick out what is the independent variable in this experiment, uh, what is being changed, and it looks like we are changing the time of exercise and what was our, our dependent variable. We're measuring heart rate for a result. We're measuring how fast the students' hearts were beating after certain amounts of exercise. A second question went along with this one. You were given the same data, but it was suggested that students omitted or left out certain data because it was unexpected. And they repeated it until they got the data that they thought they should get. What was wrong with that? Well, the students were introducing bias into their experiment. By, by not reporting all their results truthfully, they were biasing their results. Here's another typical sort of question, and I think actually two questions could come out of this. If a bacterium doubled every 20 minutes, which graph would show that relationship? So I would take a piece of scrap paper and say, well, I started with one bacterium, 20 minutes later I had two, 20 minutes later I had four, then I had 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. Which graph shows this? Make sure you look at each graph. I can eliminate this one right off the bat. It's not showing any increase in the number of bacteria. If I look at this one, they increase relatively quickly and level out. Well, I'm not seeing that happen and with my little bit of math. So I'm left with these two choices. And I'm going to go with choice B. My numbers start out relatively low, 1, 2, 4, and then they increase very rapidly. This is the correct choice. You might recognize this from math class as exponential growth. Uh, many times new organisms in an environment will grow exponentially. It can't continue forever. Eventually they'll run out of food, water, and living space. So it will level out and fluctuate a little bit as it reaches something called carrying capacity. So we've covered a lot in this short review. Um, the independent variable, just as a reminder, is what the experimenter is changing or varying in their experiment. The dependent variable is what we measure for a result. Our control group is used for, for comparison to the experimental group. The constants, the, the factors that we keep the same, that way we ensure that we only have one independent variable. Bias is what we want to avoid. We want to report all the data and we want to keep an open mind and remember which variable goes on which axis of the graph, the independent variable on the x, dependent variable on the y. Make sure you think about this and you come to class ready to ask some questions what is it you're unsure of or would like some more information on? And I hope this is going to be helpful for you to do well on your exam.